Rick, I appreciate your coming in today. Uh, nice to be here, in. John. <laughs> okay. Um, tell me your real name. Uh, Richard Allen Arbogast. Okay. And when were you born? Uh, May 5th, 1946. Where do you live now? I live uh, in uh, Ocean Springs, Mississippi. The on the Gulf? Yes. Okay. Yes. About a mile and a half from the beach. Uh, did you ever get hit with a hurricane? Yes. You did? Yes. Uh, I was. Uh, I went through Hurricane Katrina oh boy. Uh, and uh, stayed home. Uh, I just went uh, through it in my house. That's an experience in and of itself. Yes, sir. Well. <laughs> okay. It really tore up South Mississippi. Oh, boy. Where did you live before then? Uh, Fremont, Ohio. And how long were you up there in Fremont? 30 years. That must have been soon after you got out of the Army or, or something? About a year. About a year after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the library likes to get a little family tree. So who was your mother and father? What was your father's name? My father's name was Albert Clayton Arbogast. Mm -hmm. And your uh, mother's name? And my mother's name was uh, Willa Carolyn Keck. Spell that last name. K-U-E-C-K. -E okay. Were they both from Scioto County? No, neither. Where were they from? Um, my dad was from Sunbury, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and my mom was from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Pennsylvania and Arkansas. Yes. So how did they meet? <laughs> they, they, they met um, during uh, World War II in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, my dad was stationed at a nearby air base. He was in the Army Air Corps, and uh, my mom was a nursing student at a hospital in St. Louis. Oh, my. And the rest is history. And the rest is history, yes. <laughs> Well, let's see how far can you go back. What was your grandparent on your on your father's side? What was your grandparents' name? Um, Harry Alonzo Arbogast, and um, my grandmother's name was Jenny Stahl. Was her uh, maiden name S T A H L Arbogast? Mm -hmm. Can you go back any further than that? I can't, uh, but I, I I do it. Uh, but I do have a lineage that. Who in the family's done that research? My cousin, my cousin's husband, uh, does a lot of genealogy, okay. and uh, and then my cousin is on the Arbogast side, mm -hmm. and they still live in uh, Pennsylvania, okay. and so uh, he he uh, did all that research. Interesting. Um, how about on your mother's side? What was her her parents' names? Uh, her parents' names were uh, John and Myrtle Keck. However, my mother was adopted when she was three years old. And from what we can tell, what she remembers, uh, her name was uh, Grace Wyatt, and she was from Fairfield, Iowa. And then she was adopted by the Keck, John and Myrtle Keck, uh -huh. uh, and uh, then they moved to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Um, do you have any brothers and sisters? Yes. Okay. Who? Uh, my sister, uh, Linda Powell, uh -huh. uh, my brother Terry Arbogast, and my brother Scott Arbogast. Where do they live? Linda lives here. Portsmouth, Ohio. Portsmouth, Ohio. Terry lives in Columbus, mm -hmm. and Scott lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. Are you married, single, divorced, widowed, separated, all of the above? Uh, <laughs> I'm married, yes. <laughs> How long have you been married? Six years. What's your wife's name? Wanda. Do you have any children? No. Uh, she, you've been, where, where is she from? Uh, she's from South Mississippi. Okay. Um, okay. Um, are you currently employed or retired? I'm retired. What did you retire from? Uh, I retired twice. Uh, once from a factory in Fremont, Ohio, where we made disc brake rotors. Made what? Disc brake rotors for the automobile industry. Okay, yeah. And uh, the second time from the U.S. government, uh, I worked for the uh, VA at uh, the VA Biloxi Hospital. Biloxi, Mississippi? Biloxi, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, where did you graduate high school from? Clay. Clay? That's in South County. Isn't yes. It? What year did you graduate? 1964. Um, when you when you were in high school, did you have any little summer jobs or anything like that? Yes, I did. What did you do? Uh, well, I had a job actually summer and winter. Yeah. Uh, I uh, 
I drove the pill wagon for Staker Service Drugs. You at, did at uh, at Ninth and Chillicothe Street. Yes, yes. I did. it's still there, isn't it? it the, the, yes, yes. Do they still have the pill wagon? Yeah, um, I don't think they call it the pill wagon anymore. <laughs> the, the pill wagon was a, it was a, a little blue uh, station wagon with a mortar and pestle on top of oh, it that yeah. lit up. <laughs> yes. I think they still have that mortar and pestle they, somewhere. I think, I'm sure they on do. On their displays or something. Um, so you drove that, and then you, you graduated, too, from Clay in 1964. Yes. And uh, after you graduated, what did you do? Uh, I went to uh, Ohio University Portsmouth Branch uh -huh. uh, for a year. What did you major in? Um, I, Anything? Was, it, yes. Uh, I, they they kind of tell you what to take, and I took you know just a variety of general courses. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, because I worked at Stakers, I wanted to be a pharmacist, but I didn't do well in chemistry, so okay. that, that pharmacy didn't. was out. That pharmacy was out. <laughs> yes. Well, the college was out. I, college I was wasn't. Out. I wasn't a good student. I don't know what that is. They're Something. tearing down the old Krispy Kreme yeah, over they here. Are. Goodbye, Krispy Kreme. Yeah. Um, so then, um, what happened? I mean, you you you're in college for a while. Then what comes next? Um, well, uh, like I said, I didn't do well, so um, uh, they didn't. Uh, Ohio University didn't invite me back uh, for another year. <laughs> you know, they said I, you have to uh, stay out for a year, and uh, at that time it was 1965, and the, the draft was going pretty strong, so I got drafted. Um, you got drafted by the Army? Yes. Was it? Okay. And so when did you, um, well, let me ask you this, what, what did your folks think about you being drafted, going in the Army? Um, they, well, I don't really know. I, you know, we didn't talk about it much, but uh, my options were very limited, you know, either yeah. go or uh, bad things happen. So, uh, and they're, uh, so they, and they, they were, you know, they, well, if you they gotta had go, to go, you got to go. Yes. What, was your dad ever in the service? Yes, he was. He was. Yes. Okay. Oh, was he, oh, you told me he was in the Army Air Corps, wasn't he? Okay. War, and World War II, yes. Did he go overseas? Anyway? No. Uh, so now you're in the Army, and um, are you the oldest born of, the, of your siblings or youngest? or where are I'm, you? I'm the oldest. Okay. Um, where did you do your basic? Fort Knox, Kentucky. So from uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, or Clay Township, you, how did you get there? How did you get, uh, tell me what happened. What's the process of being drafted in 1965? <laughs> well, uh, I got my draft notice, Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, uh, 1965, and then I was inducted into uh, the Army at the induction station in Ashland, Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, March 23rd. How'd you get to Ashland? Take a bus, or took, took a bus with a, a lot of a few other draftees. A couple other guys. Huh? Yes, that we all we, that we were easy to spot. We just had a little gym bags, and that was, <laughs> we were traveling light. Did you get on the bus down here at the old bus at the, at the old Greyhound uh, Depot it's downtown? Not there anymore. It's not it? there anymore. Yeah. Okay. So you're in Ashland, and uh, how long did that induction take place? An hour, a couple hours, all day? Uh, a couple hours. Then after that, what did you come back home then, or no? Went straight to Fort Knox. Yes, okay. got on got on a bus, went to Fort Knox. When when you get off the bus at, at Fort Knox, uh, how's it smell? How's it <laughs> look? How's it <laughs> taste? What do you think? Well, I, I don't remember uh, much how it smelled or anything like that, and and uh, we got there. It was uh, in the evening, so they had a place for us, a barracks. Uh, to spend the night, and then the next morning, um, uh, we they started turning us into soldiers. You know, we drew our uniforms and got our hair cut and that sort of thing. What was your sergeant like? He was a tough guy. He was. A, yes, he was. Did he make you a soldier? Uh, yes, he did. How yes, long did. was basic training? Eight weeks. After now, uh, Fort Knox then was armor, wasn't it? it was armor. Yes. But they are training you basic to be an infantryman. Would that be correct to say? Well, no. In the Army, uh, you go through basic training, and they um, try to get the civilian out of you. Did it work? Yes. They're, the Army's very good at that sort of thing. They've yeah. been doing it for a long time. 
Yes. So then you cease to become an individual and you become a uh, part of the big machine. Then what did you do? You have AIT after yes. that. And, and then, well, while you were at Fort Knox, were you ever given any leave or did you go into Louisville any or anything? Yes. Did you? Yeah. Like on the weekends or something? Yes. One weekend pass in, into Louisville. Yes. Okay. Um, and then after, after your basics is over, did you go home for a while? Yes. And how long I was that? Maybe a week. I, I don't really remember. Okay. Yeah. Maybe did, 10 days. I don't know. Did, it wasn't your, long. did your folks notice a difference in you? I'm sure they did. <laughs> then where do you go then after, after that, your AIT, advanced training? Fort Dix, New Jersey. What was that about? What did you train to do there? Uh, infantry. infantry. It was I infantry AIT, yes. Okay. Um, how long was that? Eight, another eight weeks. At, at that time, did you train on, uh, was, it wasn't an M16, was it? Was no. It, it M14? Or yes. Was it? Okay. Yes. And, and, and every other small arm from the uh, 45 caliber pistol up to the M2 50 cal machine gun. Uh, they, we, we trained on every every small arm that the Army had at that time, shotguns, okay. grenade launchers. and. What was Fort Dix like? It was hot. Was uh, it? I, I went through there in the, um, in the summer. Um, let's see. But as I remember, it was, it pretty, was hot. pretty hot. Fort Dix is in New Jersey. Yes. Did you get any, any leave into New York? Yes, I did. Did you? Yes. Did you have fun? Yes, I did. <laughs> but well, I, I was a soldier, and, and even then, you know, soldiers weren't real. And I, and I didn't have a lot of money. Um, and another fellow and I uh, went down to New York City, took a bus down on payday. I spent all my Army pay and then rode home for, <laughs> for money for the rest of the month. And that's... <laughs> They sent you some bucks. And they, mom and dad sent some bucks. Yeah, yeah. mom did. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so, so you, um, what was your rank then? Was it PFC or what? E two um, or something like that? Yes. Yeah, I was an E two, and then after, after AIT, I, I was promoted to PFC. Um, tell me, Rick, what does a young, unmarried soldier? do on his leave time? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you laugh. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Oh. Um, and, and, and usually we didn't go anywhere. And uh, I wasn't, uh, I remember my pay would being 70 or $80 a month, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a lot. Well, it was, it was more money back then than it is now. But uh, back then it was, uh, Still not a lot of money, and and I didn't. I went down to New York City once, and and um, and the rest of the time, I think I just hung around the uh, uh, hung around Fort the, Dix. Fort Dix, and there's not much. Well, I don't know. There's some bars out there, and you can go out and get a beer, you know, or you can get a beer on post. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're there. Did, did you like uh, at that point? Uh, were you liking the army or not? Uh, not. Uh, but uh, there's, you, you, uh, it, it wasn't a matter of whether you liked it or not. You'd rather be somewhere else doing something else than uh, getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, getting yelled at all day, and then go to bed as tired as you can be at um, 8 or 9 or 10 o'clock at night. Did they still yell at you at yes. AIT? Yes. Did they? Yes. So, so you're finished with AIT. What, what did you do then? Did you come home for a little leave then too? Maybe, probably? Yes, I, yes I did, yes I did. After AIT, I came home for leave. What are your orders then to after that? Um, after AIT, actually I stayed at Fort Dix uh, for, let's see. I got, probably got out of, graduated from AIT in August of 66 and then I was held over waiting orders mm -hmm. uh, in uh, during basic at Fort Knox uh, I came down on a list that said that I could go to OCS if I wanted to mm -hmm. so uh, and, and that's what my dad had done during World War II oh, yeah. so um, 
I thought about it for a while, and then I said, oh, okay, I'll do that. Uh, and so um, I, uh, I was held over at, uh, at Fort Dix until October while they were waiting for a class date and everything at the, at the infantry school of Fort Benning, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I, I was there till October and then I went home on leave and then um, October, late October, um, I started uh, in, the, uh, in the infantry school. OCS? OCS. OCS. Uh, Officer Candidate School. Officer Candidate School. And you graduated from there? Yes. And they'll give you a second lieutenant commission, wouldn't they? That's correct. Yeah. In, in the Army Reserve. In the you Reserve. Don't, you don't get to be a second lieutenant in the regular Army. Um, you, uh, when you graduate, uh, you're a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Reserve, so you're actually discharged. Hmm. Uh, and um, uh, my pay grade at the time was E5, so I was discharged in E5. And, uh, and then the Army Reserve picked me up and put me on active duty at the same place at the same time, and this all happened overnight while I was sleeping. <laughs> and you woke up in the morning, you were a lieutenant yes. in the U.S. Army. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. How, how, long was, uh, how long was the officer candidate school? Six months. Six months. Are they training you at infantry there? Yes. Was that infantry? Yes. So uh, at at that point you, you you were still a second lieutenant. What are your orders then? Jump school. Well, jump school. Jump school. Yes. Okay. Which which is right there at Fort Benning. Right so I didn't. There. And uh, we graduated on a Sunday. I started jump school, which is the parachute school, no. uh, on Monday, and that was three weeks. Now when you when you were um, when you woke up as a lieutenant, mm -hmm. was anybody yelling at you then? No. <laughs> no. But when I went to jump school. I, I still got yelled at. Yes. By sergeants? Yes. Yes. Sergeants are yelling at this? Yes. <laughs> when you, yes. When you got your butter bar, are you still it's, are uh, yelling that, at uh, by sergeants? I, yes. Well, in order, I guess they have to yell in order to get your attention and in order for you to do the right thing because this training is very important. You know, you don't want to make too many mistakes after, during jump school or in after. Um, how long is jump? You said three weeks. Yes, three weeks jump school. How many jumps do you have to make? Five in jump school. Right. So then you get your little parachute. To then you get your jump. parachute wings, yes. Okay. And then um, what, what happened then? Uh, well, at the end of OCS, uh, the Army had me fill out a, a piece of paper uh, requesting my next duty assignment. Uh, and at that time, I was, uh, by the time I had finished OCS, the infantry school, I was, um, I, I was I'm pretty much a soldier by then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I wanted to serve uh, in a uh, elite outfit. So I picked the 101st Airborne Division. So I put down that I wanted to uh, go to the 101st Airborne Division, which the Army was more than glad to do because they said, this crazy guy, he's, you know. So, uh, so then that's when they sent me to jump school. And then after jump school, I had to leave, and then I reported to the 101st Fort Campbell, Kentucky. That's Fort Campbell, isn't it? Yes. Was there some reason you didn't pick the 82nd Airborne? Yes. What? I, I like the 101st better. There you the, go. I they just, have an eagle. They have the screaming eagle, yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, in fact, uh, the 101st was in Vietnam. Did you go to Vietnam? Yes. Okay. So when you report to Fort Campbell there in Kentucky, how long were you in Kentucky? Then what happened to you? Um, this was the summer of 67, which was, there was a lot of things happening in the world uh, during that summer. So, um, and then they take brand new second lieutenants and you train, you, um, they send you to one school or another um, to do what they need at the company level. You know, I was, uh, um, when I got to the 101st, I wound up uh, in the, uh, as the platoon leader of uh, the third platoon of B Company, 2nd Battalion, 501st Parachute Infantry, 2nd Brigade, 101st Airborne Division. There you are. Yeah. So, uh, 
and then the, so I went to numerous schools and and also we had some pretty interesting duty that summer uh, I went to the riots in Detroit mm -hmm. um, and that was in late July early August the end of July the first part of August these were the racial riots those were the race they, riots in Detroit. Detroit down right? yes okay. yes mm -hmm. yeah um, and uh, they picked us because uh, the the airborne can fast, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's uh, that's what happened. I think um, Sunday evening, I went to bed, or before I went to bed, uh, I was watching television, and and on the TV it said there were race riots in Detroit. Monday morning, I reported into the uh, at breakfast at the, at the company. Monday morning, um, we we talked about it at the table, at. 10 a.m. Monday morning, uh, the um, there was a rumor going around we might go. And uh, at noon we got the word to go, and at 5 p.m. that afternoon, Monday afternoon, uh, the airplanes were landing at Selfridge Air Force Base outside of Detroit. Mm. And that was your first assignment, I guess you, I was going to say combat, but that would whatever. Uh, it was. We had we had live bad. You were locked and loaded there. Weren't yes. You? Um, so you're a second lieutenant in charge of a platoon. Yes. Right. Uh, were you promoted to first lieutenant at some point? Uh, a year later. A year later. Yeah. Spent um, a year as a second lieutenant. Did you have a good captain of your company? The most excellent captain. He was, uh, he was one of the finest officers that I met uh, all the time that I was in the Army. It was uh, Jimmy Nichols was his what name. What was his name? J Jimmy Nichols. Jimmy Nichols. And he was from Mabin, Mississippi. Okay. Is he still down there? or is No, Jimmy passed away uh, oh. 20 years ago. Okay. Um, how long did you live in Mississippi? Uh, I've lived in Mississippi for almost 20 years now. Okay. I moved down there in 2001. So did you have any before. contact with him after? Yes. Did uh, uh, well, actually, before I moved. Uh, he died about the same time that I was moving, so... Uh, but uh, we had contact after after Vietnam, and and uh, and we'd we'd get together every once in a while. How long were you in Detroit? Um, I, it, I remember two weeks. Then you come back to Fort Campbell. Yes. What happens then? Uh, we were on uh, strip alert, what they what the airborne calls strip alert, and that means that the airplanes are on the runway, all leaves are canceled, and our bags are packed, and we're ready to go for the Six Day War in Israel. Really? Yes, uh, just in case that we were needed there, mm -hmm. uh, which we weren't. The Israelis handled it and, and uh, we didn't have to go anywhere, but, but we were ready. Were you uh, packed and ready to go? Were you on the tarmac or were you in the no, barracks? No, we were in the barracks. You were in your barracks, mm -hmm. but you were ready. Yes. That's the point. Yep. Well, then after that experience, mm -hmm. what happened? Then um, we started training to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, the Army had decided that, uh, that they were going to send the 101st to Vietnam, and this was 67. Uh, and so uh, we started training pretty hard, which is, <laughs> we were in Kentucky where it was nice and cold, and then we were getting snowed on out in the woods mm -hmm. and everything like that to get ready to go to Vietnam. <laughs> Training to live in the jungle, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. but it was still, it was, you know, you had to do what you. That, had to that's do. right. That was, that was all we had. So um, after after that, when did you go to Vietnam? Then? When did the unit? Did the whole division go at that point? Yes. Did they? Yes. Okay. At that time, actually, just two brigades. One brigade was already over there. Oh. Uh, the first brigade of the hundred first had been in Vietnam since '65. And the other two, the second and third brigade, were still at Fort Campbell. And then in December of 67, uh, the uh, second and third brigade uh, flew uh, by Air Force. Uh, the Air Force uh, flew us to Vietnam. Did you stop over anywhere, like San yes. Francisco? Or yes. We, we stopped at San Francisco, uh, which is Travis Air Force Base, I believe. Then we flew to Wake Island, where we stopped and refueled. And then we flew into uh, Clark Air Base in the Philippines. But we didn't get off the plane there. We just waited 
to get in the stack as a, uh, waited our turn uh, to uh, land the planes at, at Benoit. Benoit is where you landed, ended mm -hmm. up there. Okay. Um, before you went there, did you have leave, go home a little yes. bit? Yes. Yeah. Now, by that time, you're an officer, and mm -hmm. uh, your dad had been an officer. Mm -hmm. uh, could you relate pretty well with both of you? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't remember much uh, what Dad thought about. It. I, th I, th I know they were proud of me. Mm -hmm. uh, they came, uh, Mom and Dad came down for my graduation at Fort Benning, Georgia, and uh, and I know I, I'm pretty sure they were pretty proud of me. Okay. They probably didn't expect me to do that well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, OU didn't turn out. No, too well. <laughs> no. That, and this, see, that's the kind of uh, track record that I had uh, up to that, you know, up to the Army, and so okay. it, it wasn't good. Uh, did you get off the plane at Wake Island? Yes. Did you? Mm -hmm. Okay. How long were you there? Uh, I don't remember exactly. And all I remember about getting off the plane at Wake Island was it was very hot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we went into a little terminal that they had in there and had some ice cream. Well, did you? Yeah. So I thought that was pretty nice. That was a World War II battle. Uh, yes. There. Yes. Okay. Uh, so now you uh, go to the Philippines and then you wait to get on the stack to mm -hmm. your turn. And you go to, and you're in Benoit then. Yes. In Benoit. Benoit, Vietnam. Yes. So uh, the door opens up, mm -hmm. plane, you mm -hmm. step out. How's yep. it smell? How's it, it feel? It was different. It was a different smell? Vietnam, which is a beautiful country, if there, if there wasn't a war going on, I'm sure it's, it's a very beautiful country now, but, uh, but by then, but then, um, Vietnam always smelled to me like there was something burning, and a lot of times there was. Uh -huh. uh, and so that's that's the smell I remember of Vietnam is uh, mm -hmm. is kind of smoky. Was it hot? Yes. By that time you had trained in the Kentucky woods, getting snowed on. So yes. <laughs> yes. We we can't say you're exactly ready for the jungle. Not exactly, but. Uh, the Army decided that we were going to spend 30 days uh, in Vietnam before they actually sent us anywhere to do anything. And, uh, and so we went to a base camp called Kuchi, which was the, uh, the base camp of the uh, 25th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we operated kind of out of Kuchi. The 25th was handling all of the rough stuff and everything like that, and we were just kind of uh, going out, running patrols, and coming back and getting used to the heat. Hmm. Um, what, how, how many men in your platoon? Was it 40 or something like that? 40, 43. Okay. But when we deployed, mm -hmm. was it a good platoon? I mean, I mean, platoon. the guys, uh, the yes. soldiers, yes. no problems. No. Well, I mean, once in a while, there's well, a uh, the, the regular old army problems. Yes, yes. army problems. Yeah. So now you're in Kuchi. After, after Kuchi, where did you go? Um, we went up to uh, Fubai, which is uh, another uh, fairly large air, air base. And, um, and it's up in what they call i which is the, the first uh, couple of provinces up uh, close to the uh, DMZ. Mm -hmm. And it's a little south of Way City. Okay. And so uh, we... Uh, uh, we went up, we got off the, the planes at uh, Fubai and established a, went, we marched up the road and established a fairly large base camp that later became uh, Camp Eagle, which was the uh, headquarters of the 101st in Vietnam. You're up there with the Marines, aren't you? We were pretty close to the Marines. The Marines were up right on the DMZ and, uh, and they were up in, um, I believe that that's Quang Tri Province. Mm -hmm. Quang Tri Province is uh, right up on the DMZ, and we were the next province down, which is Tua Ten Province. Were you there during Tet? Yes, that's where I was when Tet broke out. Where you, you say you were pretty close to Hue also. That's the old ancient capital. It's the, yes. yes. Were you able to go in the way, or yes. did you have to go in the way during combat? Yes. Uh, the Marines went in there and did all the house-to-house -house fighting in, in Way City, 
And what we did was we operated out of a fire base uh, that was um, a little north of Way City, up toward up Highway One toward Quang Tree, um, and and we were running uh, company-sized patrols in between Way City and the jungle, and because uh, and it was mostly North Vietnamese up there. You know, I mean, there were probably some Viet Cong around, but but uh, mostly what we were up against was the North Vietnamese Army. So you make contact at that oh, point. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, when did when did you know that Tet had started? What was the the indicators there? It was just the news, country, uh, everywhere in Vietnam. In, in Vietnam, we had we had radios, the Armed Forces uh, radio. You know, we had uh, transistor radios, and you could get uh, Armed Forces radio most anywhere in country. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we, we did have. Uh, you know, we had news reports and, and music and uh, stuff like that on Armed Forces Radio. Um, but um, uh, so we knew that something big was happening. Mm -hmm. But we had to more or less focus on what was in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and the, the colonel would call down to the captain and he would say, Captain, I want you to take your company and come from here and uh, march over to there. And tell me what you see along the way, and, and that's uh, that's basically what we did. So when it when it broke out, then were you surprised, or you sort of had a feeling that something was going to happen? I had, I was surprised, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, I had no no indication of what was what was going to happen. But I'll, let me tell you about the Tet Offensive. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, we uh, we whipped them boys bad uh, during the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when uh, they decided to come out of the jungle and, and stand up and fight in unit size and everything like this, all right? And, uh, and they got whipped from the DMZ to the Delta, and they took a lot of casualties during the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was reported in the United States that this is, uh, you know, we're in bad shape over there. And, and we were. I mean, uh, the U.S. forces took a lot of casualties, but uh, we uh, we gave back better than we took, mm -hmm. and uh, in in reality, uh, we we beat them guys up pretty bad uh, during the Tet Offensive, and that's what really happened. Uh, depending on you know what you hear back in the states, and everybody back in the states thought, well, they've got a handle on it, and these uh, these are a bunch of uh, uh, pajama wearing. Uh, Gorillas, and, and it's just a matter of time before we'll we'll have them uh, uh, taken care of. And of course, that didn't happen uh, because they were tough guys. Uh, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese—they were tough guys. There's no doubt about it. And they were mean, and they were uh, they were uh, motivated by nationalism mostly. Uh, to defend, and they were defending their country from us. Did you read the book Way by Mark Bowen? No, I haven't. It's a good, it's a good book about the Tet and the Battle of the Way. Yeah, uh, and the Marines took a, that, was, took that was a tough fight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you ever make it over to Quezon? No, didn't, didn't get up that far. What did you hear back in the States? Uh, you're, you're in Vietnam. Your folks and everybody in the states. What, what did you hear about the protest? Did you hear anything about protest the war? I don't remember hearing much about it, uh, and it, it certainly wasn't as much as you could see back here in the states on the Sunday night news. Uh, you know, we didn't we didn't get that. Uh, well, where I was, we didn't have televisions, but but we had, did have Armed Forces Radio, and I probably and, and we did have um, magazines, Look and Life, and and uh, Saturday Evening Post maybe or Time, or, you know, we, uh, those, those were there. Mm -hmm. So we probably knew 
that there was something going on, but we didn't know to what extent. How long did, uh, were you in Vietnam, a year or more? I was in for a year. Uh, then you rotated back to the States? Yes. When, when did you leave Vietnam? December of 68. December. So your time there was a year. You were there for a year. Yes. And uh, you think back on it, what do you think? That year of your life? Well, it was real. Uh, and I, I really don't have any, I, I'm very proud of, uh, of what we were doing over there, okay? Not, not from the standpoint of uh, whether it was morally correct or, or uh, uh, whether it was a good idea. Uh, and I, I think history's kind of been written on, you know, maybe things could have, we could have done things better or not at all in Vietnam. I, I don't know. And that, but that didn't really matter um, to us, to, to the soldiers that were there. Our job was to be soldiers and accomplish the mission. Uh, whatever the mission was, we were soldiers. So uh, we didn't ask, well, was this the right thing to do? Uh, it, uh, it, it was, and that's, uh, that's just what you do. Were there, after a while, you're there a year, and then as you go along later in the year, were there mm -hmm. any issues with morale among any of the soldiers or the disciplinary problems? There was, mm -hmm. yeah. Were there any issues of, uh, uh, I've had one gentleman tell me that uh, they were out in the bush fighting and when they got back to base, it was the whites against the blacks. I didn't see any of that. Didn't see any of that. Um, so now you're leaving December of 60, what was 68, you said? Yeah. yeah. How'd you feel? Real good. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> yes, it was great uh, yeah. to uh, to uh, we got uh, on the airplane, took off, and the pilot came on and said that we had cleared uh, Vietnam airspace. And then what happened? Oh, in, the in plane that? just erupted in a giant cheer inside yeah. the cabin. I'll yes, it was crazy. yes, yeah. yes. Everybody. Uh, it was a. Uh, uh, Good day to be alive. Yes, it was a good day to be alive. I was lucky to be alive. What were your did you, what, what medals did you end up with? Um, I have two bronze stars, mm. uh, an air medal, mm. uh, two army commendation medals, mm, good conduct medal. You? Yes. Yeah. That's how <laughs> you know. They gave it to me, so I took it. I didn't argue. Um, what else? The, of course, the National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam Service Medal, mm -hmm. um, and the, um, yeah, that, that's about it. Purple Heart? No Purple Heart. Didn't get a I, scratch. Didn't get, I, I did get a scratch, uh, but I didn't do anything about it. I uh, put a Band-Aid on, had, to, had the what? medic, I, I had the medic give me a Band-Aid, uh. and I put it on the scratch, you know. Yeah. And he asked me, he said, do you, do you want a Purple Heart? And I said, no, not for this, you know. How'd you but, get that scratch? A briar or something? No, it was a, it was a grenade fragment. Oh, okay. It was, uh, and it was probably one of ours. You know, we were, we were throwing grenades. and Friendly thinking, grenade fire. Yeah, friendly grenade fire. And it's just a scratch. It was right across here, you know, and, uh, but it and, wasn't. And you could have had a purple heart because an American wounded you. No, uh, I just didn't want one. I didn't okay. think that a, a, a little scratch uh, merited a, uh, a Purple Heart. Okay. Uh, did any of the uh, South Vietnamese uh, Army units uh, connect with you? Yes. Okay. What was that like with them? Um, there, there, were, there were different levels of Vietnamese troops. Uh, they had, uh, like, um, regular Vietnamese Army, and we didn't work with those fellows much. But they did have, uh, like the, their National Guardsmen, who would, um, they defended their own neighborhoods and they didn't go very far away. And they were handy to have 
and we would meet with, we would hook up at a certain place at a certain time if they showed up at all. <laughs> they, they weren't really reliable. And they were called the regional forces and the popular forces. Uh, and uh, or RFPF, or what we call them was the rough puffs. The what? The rough puffs. Rough puffs. Uh, the rough puffs, yeah. So if we were going to meet with the the, uh, the, the rough puffs, well, what are we going to do? Well, we, we're going to have a platoon of rough puffs uh, come out and meet with us, and then we're going to, uh, then we'd, we would go along, and then they would talk to the villagers and uh, 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 try to get any intelligence or everything like that, but they, they weren't too tough. And then they, they would go home at night, okay? They would go back uh, to their wives and families and everything uh, at night. And they were just kind of irregulars, you know. But they went home in the evening. Yes. Their work day is over. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, do you have any souvenirs from Vietnam? Uh, let me think. Do you have your uniform? No, but I... <laughs> I did bring my boots back, the boots that I wore in the field, and um, and now uh, they are in a, a glass case at uh, VFW Post Two Nine Four Seven in Fremont, Ohio. Okay. So I, I gave them my boots, and they because they have a glass case where they have different souvenirs and stuff from different. Uh, so so when you came, when when were you discharged? Um, April of sixty nine. When you came back, did you fly into, was it Portland, Seattle, or where did you fly into? San Francisco, Travis. Uh, uh, San Francisco. San Francisco. When you got off the plane, were you wearing your uniform? Yes. I came all the way back here in my uniform. Any incidents along the way or any problems? No. Uh, no. Nobody, nobody messed with me, and, and uh, they put us on a bus at the Air Force Base and drove us down to the airport in... Uh, uh, San Francisco, and I caught a plane out of there. Was that straight to Columbus? Nope. Uh, I had stopped in Indianapolis on the way back because I had an aunt hmm. that uh, that lived in Indianapolis, and she was very good to me while I was in Vietnam because my aunt was World War II. You know, she was a uh, um, and and sending the, the guys, and she used to send goodie packs, you know, with uh, Kool-Aid and Jiffy Pop. You were Jiffy a very Pop popular and, officer. <laughs> I, well, I, I don't know about all that. You'd have to ask somebody else, but uh, um, I, I don't know. But I, I you know, and she did, uh, she, she used to send cookies and, and stuff like that, which was great. So I stopped off and saw her for, I think we just had lunch, and I got back on a plane. Did your folks know you were coming back at that very hour? Yes. And you didn't knock on the door and it'd be a big surprise or anything? No. Did, no, did they, they meet you at the airport? Or yes, did, did in uh, uh, Minford. In Minford? Yeah. I, fl I, flew, uh, I flew into Cincinnati and then oh. got uh, a, back then you could fly into a commercial or you could fly into Minford. Okay. So I, they picked me up in Minford. Um, after, after what happened then? I mean, you, uh, you're discharged finally. Yep. Uh, yep. And then what did you do? Get a job or yes. go to school or what? Get it? What, what did you do? Uh, I got. I was only out for three weeks, and I got a job as a brakeman for the N and W, out, out of Portsmouth and Free Arts here. Yeah. How long were you there with that? Um, a little over a year. Mm -hmm. and this was April, maybe 15 months. How'd you end up in Fremont, Ohio? Well, the coal miners went on strike in West Virginia in the summer of 69, no, summer of 70, yeah, summer of 70. So I got laid off uh, from the N&W, and, uh, and my brother lived in Sandusky, Ohio, and he said, uh, come up here, live with me, and he says, there are all kinds of factory jobs up here, and you can get a factory job, make a few bucks, until uh, the railroad calls you back. And I was uh, still thinking about uh, going back to uh, uh, college. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe I'll get a factory job, put a few bucks together, go back to college. So I, I went up there and I found a job making disc brakes at a factory that had just opened up in uh -huh. uh, 1970. They just opened a place up. 
in, in Fremont, Ohio, which is 20 miles from Sandusky. And you were there for the rest until you retired? For 31 years. 31 years. Um, when did you get married? Uh, the first time, uh, 1979. Okay. Were you up in Sandusky then? Was in Fremont. Up there? Okay. Yeah, married to Fremont girl, yeah. Okay. And then the second time you got married when? Um, six years ago, which would be 2016. Um, you want to nail that down. She might be watching this. Well, uh, it was just, it, and I'd, I'd better, uh, uh, to Wanda, my, uh, my beautiful wife. Exactly. And, um, and we got married uh, uh, July the 8th, 2016. Were you involved in any veterans groups, VFW or stuff like that? Yes. What, yeah. where was VFW, mainly the VFW. Although I'm also, I also belong to the Legion and the Vietnam Veterans of America. Um, was that in Fremont that you were up there? Yes, in, in, uh, up there and uh, now in, uh, in South Mississippi. Did you have any post, any officer ships in the in Yes. The, what was it? Uh, I've been uh, commander of the Fremont Post twice mm -hmm. uh, for two years at, with a little space in between. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've been commander of the, uh, the VFW Post where I'm a member now for three. And the, right now, I'm the post chaplain. You are? Okay. Yeah. In Mississippi? Yes. Post uh, 6731 in Diverville, Mississippi. While you were in the Army, uh, military, did you ever meet any famous people? Did you see Westmoreland? No, I never saw Westmoreland. I saw the Bob Hope Show. The Bob? You went I, to the Bob I, Hope I, Show? I got to go see uh, Bob Hope Show, um, and that was Christmas. Of '67, when we were at Coochie, mm -hmm. and uh, and we were uh, had just gotten there, and um, but I was way in the back. But Ann Margaret there? Yes, Ann Margaret <laughs> was there. Yes, Ann Margaret was there. Yeah. Um, then, um, how would you sum up your experience in the military in the in the army? What would you say about it? It was. Very educational. It, it was my college education that I, I was too lazy and uh, to get going to a, a college and everything like that. But uh, but the, in the army, you get an education because they throw you in the deep end and see if you oh, can swim. See if you can swim. <laughs> well, you swam. I, I learned how to swim. Yeah. So that that was my education. I, I met a, a lot of fine people. I met a lot of fine people in the United States Army, and I, I've met a lot of fine veterans since uh, I've gotten out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, um, overall, I didn't get killed. You know, if I had been killed or seriously wounded, it wouldn't have been all that great an experience. But I lived through it, um, and, uh, and so I can look back on it, and it was a real, real world experience. It was uh, no fooling around, no, uh, th this isn't theoretical stuff here. You know, this isn't book learning or anything like this. It's, uh, it's, it's real world, uh, and, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of that because it's hard work. Um, I mean, you know, living in the bush, uh, rolled up in the, in the rain in a, in a poncho, uh, day after day after day, and then you get up in the morning, and then you get shot at, and then you go roll up in a poncho at night again, and then you're only, you get two hours sleep, and you have to uh, get up and stay alert, and then, you know, you might get another two hours, and you two on, two off, uh, that sort of thing, you know, and, it, and, it's, and it's very, it's extremely difficult, it is, it's, it's hard work. Did you ever see the movie Platoon? Yes. How I've seen most of the Vietnam movies. Did what? I've seen most of the Vietnam movies. How does that compare? It, it was the best. Platoon? Platoon uh, was probably the best, most accurate Vietnam movie that I saw. Mm -hmm. That's because of Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone is not he only- He was there. Yes. And, and he was a, he served as an infantryman in Vietnam and- He was with the 25th, wasn't he? I think. I thought he was in the, the fourth, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, and he, he's also a most excellent uh, filmmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, his his other films uh, are 
are very good. So. And, and I, I met, I, I got to meet Oliver Stone. One Did you? Not in Vietnam, but uh, years later in Washington, D.C. Why were, why were you in Washington, D.C. and ended up meeting him? Uh, I went up to the dedication, 1982, the dedication of the Vietnam Wall. There was a group of us uh, veterans from Fremont, Ohio, that piled into cars and RVs and, and, uh, and caravan uh, up to Washington, D.C. We all uh, uh, slept on the floor and everything in two uh, hotel rooms to save money, and I think there was uh, 12 or 13 of us, and, um, uh, and then went to the dedication of the, uh, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. And at that time, um, they were having a, a screening of a television show called Tour of Duty. And it hadn't even been broadcast yet, but they wanted uh, some Vietnam vets to come down and take a look at the pilot or something like that, you know, and they, they wanted our opinions on uh, what it was, you know. And, and so I just happened to be in the group that did that, and Oliver Stone was there. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he had anything to do with the TV show or not, but he just happened to be there. That reminds me, before we started the interview, he, he made another movie, JFK. But, uh, yes, we made and, several. And then, you, you know, you were telling me uh, about seeing the funeral of JFK. Yes. yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I was a senior in high school, Clay. Yeah. And uh, the, the principal uh, came on the, uh, I was in chemistry class. And uh, that's the way I remember it. Uh, but the principal came on the, uh, PA system uh, in there and said that the president had been shot in Dallas, Texas. And then he came on again about maybe a half an hour later and said that the president had died. Uh, and I can't remember if this was Friday or Thursday. That's something that's a little bit, but anyway, I know that um, Friday after school, I was uh, having dinner with my family and uh, the phone rang and it was my friend Jay Newberry. Who was it? Jay Newberry. Jay Newberry. Yeah. Newberry he, Sporting Goods? Uh, he, he was related mm -hmm. uh, to the Newberries, but uh, his uh, mom and dad were school teachers. Okay. Um, and uh, Jay called up and said, uh, there's a train leaving here tonight uh, for Washington, D.C., and we can be on it and be in D.C. in the morning, which would have been Saturday morning, and that was the day of the funeral, and go to the funeral. So... Uh, so I said, I asked my mom and dad, they said, yep, go ahead. My mom and dad were like that. They, they kind of, they, they weren't too protective of me. They kind of let me go run around and anyway. That's the best mom and dad. I, I think they were great. You know, my parents were great people. Um, so, um, so we got on the train, got out to Washington, D.C. in the morning, uh, went over to the Capitol building, which uh, everybody knew at that time that that's where uh, you know the, the most of the uh, the funeral was going to be, and uh, uh, so we went over there, and uh, there was an extremely large crowd. Somebody in the crowd had a transistor radio, and that's where we learned that Lee Harvey Oswald had been shot. Wow. You know, and that that news went through the crowd with the from somebody that had a radio, and then told everybody, and that went all the way through the crowd. It was kind of a ripple effect. Uh, and then uh, Jay and I went, uh, kind of eased our way up through any little gap that we could until we got right up front. And we were in the front of the crowd, right across the street from the Capitol building, when the, uh, the horse-drawn caisson with the coffin on it uh, came down there. And Jackie and the kids and the, the Kennedy family were up on the steps. And, and the uh, uh, active duty, uh, it, sailors and Marines and Air Force and uh, Army and uh, carried the uh, casket up the up the stairs and, and into the Capitol building uh, where uh, where he was laying um, in the rotunda and so uh, so we waited for a little bit and got in line and uh, and walked through the rotunda uh, around the casket and then out the back door. Did you see Jackie? Yes. It's always one. Yeah. Yes. And the kids? And the kids. Did you see the little boy do the salute? Yes. You actually saw it? I actually saw it. I was, it was uh, maybe 50, 60 yards mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. 
Do you have dreams? Mm. Yes, everybody does. I mean, I mean everybody. about Vietnam. About uh, bad, bad dreams about about Vietnam? No. I don't know why, but I don't. I, but I know people that do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, for some reason, I've been spared that. I, I don't know why. Hey, Rick, is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, you'll probably remember stuff the way I probably. do afterward. <laughs> yes. I'm walking out to the truck, and I'll yeah. say, oh, I wish I'd asked him that. Or yeah. yeah. Um, about the only thing, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of my military service. Uh, and uh, I'm not, um, uh, I, I don't second guess it. I don't, uh, um, whether it was right or wrong, it was kind of happening above my pay grade. And uh, and I, w I was just a soldier, uh, and but uh, it was it was very difficult. Uh, it was hard work. What was your rank when you got out? Were you a first lieutenant? Yeah, I, I promoted first lieutenant. Yeah. And how how did you feel when you learned? Uh, what did you think? How did you feel when you learned that Saigon had fallen? Uh, of course, I was disappointed, uh, but. Um, we pulled out in 72, or, and we were pretty much gone by 73, you know. In my experience, I thought at the time, in 68, when I came back, and I was discharged and I wasn't a soldier anymore, I thought they should load everybody on every, uh, anything that moves ships, boats, and planes, and whatever, and, and get all the Americans out of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, that's the way I felt at the time. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and so when it was over, and the Vietnamese didn't do well without us, uh, I, I kind of expected that, actually. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Rick. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Okay, man. All right.